Hello everyone, this is Bentley, and uh, today, normally, we would be doing a live stream, but instead we're going to do an Ask Bentley segment. So, for those who were in the last live stream, maybe you're in the replay crew pretty regularly, you'll know that I'm at the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society meeting because Gary Lang's in town. Yeah, the Rainbow Fish nerd is going to go see Gary Lang, of course. But uh, that doesn't mean that we can't have something. So what I did is created a community poll. I have a whole bunch of questions, and we're going to answer them. So our first question comes from Brandon. Hey, Bentley, can crypts and swords be trained to stay short like tiger lotus? What other plants are trainable? This is a kind of a cool question because this plays off of a video we did with brother-in-law James's tank kind of starting to train his nymphaeas. Uh, and the short answer to this is not really, but kind of. <laughs> Certain species of swords are going to naturally stay smaller, especially if we give them really good light. If they're happy with the amount of light they're receiving and the photo period, they're less likely to grow tall and reach for more and more light. Several crypts are very similar. They will stay smaller when they have stronger light because they don't need to create as broad a space to capture all of that light. Now, there's kind of a limited window of crypts where this is going to be effective. It tends to be some of like the Nurii style crypts uh, and even some like Lucens where they naturally will spread out more and kind of lay flat as opposed to growing straight up. Things like your Wendetii species are going to inherently grow tall over time, but some of them under good strong light will stay a little bit shorter, but over time eventually they're going to get tall. It's just what that plant does. So, can you train them like Nymphaea? Not exactly, not through trimming, but can you train them in a sense of providing the right environments where they're more likely to stay short? Kind of. <laughs> so I, I hope that helps. Um, it's much harder with those. Like really Nymphaea is about the only truly trainable plant uh, when it comes to using those trimming techniques and, and understanding kind of just how that plant grows. But there are some ways that we can set up a proper environment that will help minimize the height of some growth in other plants. This is similar also in like dwarf Sagittaria. Um, dwarf Sag will stay shorter when it has stronger available light. When it needs to start reaching for light is when you start seeing dwarf Sag grow taller. Our second question comes from Omar, who owns a fantastic fish store out on the East Coast. Uh, New York area, if I remember correctly. I'm sure I'm going to get beat up in the comments because I don't have it perfect. But what's your favorite rainbow? It's actually got multiple questions. What plants do rainbows spawn in? Uh, in the wild versus captivity. That's actually a cool question. What's the best rainbow to breed for profit? Uh, I'll answer that one like none of them. <laughs> we'll do that. In, and that, uh, that should get you started on an interesting journey. <laughs> Thanks, Omar. <laughs> okay, so what's my favorite rainbow? Um, there's kind of two answers to this. My The rainbow fish that got me into rainbow fish, and to this day is still among my very favorites, is Bozeman Eye. Uh, there's a reason why when I built a hat for a rainbow fish convention, I put a Bozeman Eye rainbow on it, right? I love that fish. It's what got me into rainbows, and I will always love that fish. Plus, they're pretty much the most iconic rainbow that's striking, like, blue and orange, bicolor, like, cut right down the middle. It's something that most people will just never forget. My other uh, right now, and I've kind of relentlessly called this the crown jewel of my personal fish room, is the Running River Rainbow Fish. And, and part of it is because that rainbow, um, while there is some good photography out there of it, it's just so incredible in its story. And, and also, when you get a group of them, they're very tight schoolers, and not all rainbows school super tight together. They'll be a little more loose, uh, like most of your shoaling fish tend to be, but the Running River, in my experience, are very, very tight schoolers. Uh, think like your Ruminos tetras or um, Emperor tetras, right? These tetras that stay very close together, they follow each other very tightly. Running River rainbow fish, in my experience, are like that. My group does that all the time. They're a very tight group. They stay very close together when they're swimming. Plus, you get a lot of really awesome color. The males get reds and golds and these beautiful, strong black stripes. 
and they're not very big. They're only about three inches, so you can keep them pretty reliably in a group of 10 to 12 or so in a 40-gallon breeder, and they'll have space to swim around and, and do their thing. So that's, that's kind of why they continue to be one of my favorite rainbow fish. They just have a very unique set of qualities to them that you don't necessarily get in a lot of other rainbow fish. Plus, they have just this amazing story. Uh, there'll be a, a link to the Running River Rainbow Fish story video that I've done in the past up in the corner. But they're just fantastic, and I, I love them. So those are probably my top two. I, I, I can't. It's so hard. Uh, it's like uh, Gary Lang always says, it's Sophie's Choice. You can't just pick one, and then you've picked this, and now you got to pick this, and now you got to pick this. It's the way all rainbow fish nerds are. But those are, of the ones I'm keeping right now, uh, and or have kept in the past, my two absolute favorites, and I will do pretty much anything to keep them from here on out because I love those fish so much. Now let's talk about that second question. Good plants for rainbows to breed in, captivity versus the wild. This is a cool question. So in the wild, there typically aren't really many plants actually in the water systems. Um, rainbows will be in pools, in lakes, or in streams, but you do have these really dense root systems typically on the shore from a lot of uh, overgrowth and overhanging plants. So what rainbows are going to do very well in are these intricate root systems that are almost kind of like how a spawning mop is treating things naturally, just the mop is more pliable and soft, not hard wood. And over time, like algaes and all sorts of stuff are going to grow into there, but these fine root systems are something that rainbows encounter quite a lot. So you can mimic this in a kind of sort of way with your aquascaping, or you could look at things that build really nice root systems and work well as floating plants. So water wisteria, water sprite, anything that um, those kind of fern style plants that have these really great root systems but float perfectly well. Those end up being amazing natural spawning mops for rainbows. But also they'll go into things like your um, cypress health rise, your jungle valves, anything that gives them uh, a lot of space to kind of get near. I mean, they'll breed in my, my java fern here. Uh, it it kind of doesn't matter. Rainbows will spawn on just about anything. Why, hello, Mr. Courtney. <laughs> my, my dog wants to play tug of war now. Let me, let me prove to you, if you can't hear him, this is the rope he has in my hands. Now he's trying to pull it. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> this is what happens when I, when I film a pop limo. He wants to play tug of war and all sorts of stuff. Uh, now, in captivity, the other thing that we can look at is mosses. Rainbows actually will go really well to moss or some of your finer carpeting plants. Although the big problem is often they get kind of so boisterous in their activity that they will rip up a lot of your fine root carpeting plants. So things like glossostigma, for example. I've tried to keep it in the past and my rainbows tried to spawn in it like crazy. But they also swim and they, they're so fast and they create so much water movement because of the way their bodies are built that they would uproot all the glossostigma. <laughs> and it was almost impossible to keep it or like Blixa down with my rainbows. Um, you can use crypts, especially any of the crypts that have uh, kind of smaller leaves. <laughs> this dog, he's getting so close to bump my tripod too. Oh, you got it, buddy. <laughs> Do you want to come up? But yeah, those would be the options. <laughs> so I know this is so random, but my dog is like not going to give up and I just don't want him to bark. Because he's corgi and they bark at everything. Okay, uh, from Joe Sneed. Hey Bentley, is it better to pick rainbow fish every day or just leave them in the mop in a tank for a couple weeks and move the mop to another tank? Uh, this is another great question. I think this comes down to whether or not you're having issues with fungus on your eggs. If your eggs have fungus issues, which I tend to encounter here in the Northwest, and I know that some of my friends who have bred rainbows out here have also encountered. <laughs> it's just yanking on my arm. Uh, then what you might want to do is look into picking eggs each day and getting them into a separate container with a tiny amount of methylene blue, uh, in order to prevent fungus until they start hatching and then moving them to their water system. Otherwise, in general, if you're not really dealing with a lot of fungus issues, I think it's really good to let a mop go for about a week, maybe two. Uh, if you're really diligent and you see like your first couple fry, then you just move the whole mop because that's going to tell you everybody else is about to hatch and you can put them in a safe raising tank away from the adults. That would be kind of the route I would go. So it's all about how... Um, 
how relatively well you're de getting your eggs. The second thing would be, are fish in that tank picking eggs to eat and going to have a little caviar snack? If they're not, then yeah, keep that mop in there and just let them go and go and go as long as it's single species, right? We don't want multiple species. That'll cause crossbreeding and all sorts of issues. But um, <laughs> I don't know if you can hear this dog, but he's losing his mind right now. <laughs> Hi, buddy. But he won't let me pick him up. That's the problem. I want to pick him up and hold him on camera. He's like, nah, Dad. That ain't happening. He's so silly. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. If you have fish picking at them, then, of course, we want to daily go in and cycle eggs out and move them. Uh, but otherwise, if they're not a problem, if they're leaving the eggs in place after they've laid them, and I would check kind of every, uh, every morning or every night, you know, just find yourself a good time. If you know your, your fish are spawning in the morning, Check in the afternoon, like after you get off work or whatever. Uh, if they're afternoon spawners, check the following morning. If the eggs are still in the mop, you're good. If eggs are gone, then we probably need to be picking eggs every day in order to give ourselves a reasonable yield of fry. Uh, from Legion Aquatics, if you could only have one type of plant in your aquariums, what would it be? Type of plant is really broad. So in that regard, I would probably choose Crips. Um... It's, it's a really close tie between Crips and Java Fern. I happen to be really, really successful with Java Fern just in my water and the way that I keep my systems. Like, you guys can tell the tank behind me. It's, like, just Java Fern. <laughs> it's just a ton of Java Fern. But um, I, I like Java Fern a lot because it's an epiphyte, which makes it very easy. But um, a majority of my tanks, I tend to create open water up top. Uh, this is kind of one of the limited examples where I don't. And then I'll densely plant more toward the, the substrate level and stuff like that, uh, just because I keep a lot of rainbow fish, which like that mid and upper water system available to them. So uh, Crips would probably be my biggest choice. Second choice would probably be Java Fern. It would depend on whether or not I was trying to use wood in a lot of my tanks. If I'm using wood, Java Fern. If I'm going plants only, Crips. Uh, and then like a... A third choice, just if you really want to know how my brain functions and the plants that I really love, would be all the nymphaeas, so lily, lilies and lotuses, because there's a lot of variation between a couple of the species, uh, and you can potentially even get flowers out of them, which is really, really fun. But Crips probably has the most variety um, in the in the sense that like, you can get tall, kind of grassy Crips, you can get short Crips, tall Crips, big, broad Crips. Uh, there's a lot of options there, so that's going to be my number one. I love grips. Uh, from Fish Out of Water, hey Bentley, what would be your pick for a 60 gallon tank out of Rads, Parkinsoni, or Murray River Rainbows? Uh, and the <laughs> secondary question, two for one again, just like Omar. As a former Mustang owner, how do you feel about Ford calling the new EV SUV a Mustang? So we're talking about the Mustang Mach E. Uh, let me answer that, because like, I love the fact that we're, we're branching a little bit outside. That's kind of why uh, live streams are fun, right? We can go a little outside of just the fish well and ask some other questions. Uh, as many of you know, I used to own a Mustang. Uh, I had a Mustang for 16 years. This puppy dog. <laughs> now he's got a plastic bottle, which is going to be really noisy. Oh, I'm not playing tiger with that. Go on. Go on. Go play with that on your own. You silly dog. Um... And I, I love Mustangs. Classic Mustangs especially are something that I've always loved since I was a kid. Um, so anytime I get an opportunity to see a 60s Mustang especially or very early 70s up to like 72, I, I'm a very happy camper. I love Mustangs and their look and their appeal and the early thousands Mustangs. So like 2005 to about 2008, uh, I had a 2005 Mustang. They're just, they've got that very retro look to them. I love them to death. Now, I kind of uh, dislike the fact that they use the name Mustang on the Mach E. I would have actually been happier if they just called it a Mach E and not Mustang. And part of that is because it's an SUV, and I know they're trying to use some of the Mustang body lines, especially in the hood and kind of an expanded version of it in the back. And I think what they're kind of trying to do is take a, a vein from Porsche in the way that Porsche does their SUV. Can you not find the loudest thing in the house, Mr. Papalimo? I was like, oh, a rope's not enough. Let me find something way louder to play with and just really drive you wild, Dad. You don't need to bark. Nobody's here. Corgis, man. They think they're guard dogs. <laughs> so that's my rant on, on, on the Mustang. 
Uh, as far as my pick for a 60 gallon, I'm hoping this is the 60 gallon that is the 40 breeder uh, footprint, but just a little bit taller. That's actually the version of the 60 gallon that I love the most. I used to have one until it started leaking on me. <laughs> but I loved that tank when I had it. Uh, in that regard, I would say I would do rads. And the reason why I would do rads is Parkinson and I do get quite a bit bigger than a 60 gallon is going to want to have. You really want them in at least a four foot tank just because they get a fairly big body to them. And the Murray River Rainbow is kind of similar. Uh, it does eventually get a much larger body. So you'd, you'd be looking at something where to keep them at their optimal, you'd want to be moving them probably after a year or two. And that can be really, really tough to enjoy a tank if you're someone like me who likes to keep their tanks running for a long period of time. So in that case, I would choose rads. And specifically, in the case of that style of tank, I would probably go towards Series Creek. And let me explain why I choose Series Creek. Series Creek has big color variation. So often you will see them look kind of like Bozeman Eye Rainbows where the front half is blue and the rear half is orange in your males. But sometimes they'll be all blue and sometimes they're basically almost all orangish red. Uh, there's a lot of variation in this particular fish and it depends on uh, some of your where you're buying them from because some folks have been line breeding them to get more and more orange concentration in the body. Uh, I'm very lucky that the local breeder that I know he really hasn't done that. He's not trying to select for any specific color. So we get a big mixture of stuff. So I get all, mostly blue fish. I get more orange fish. I get that perfect like half and half miniature bows when I look. And I love it. I love that variation. They are usually fairly good with their fry. So you can actually kind of colony breed them some. They'll pick off some here and there. But if you have good planting, fry are going to survive and do well. And they're just a cool little active fish. They've got that kind of Parkinsoni body shape to them. They're just the tiny, tiny version. And that's what I like about that particular fish. So I would go with the Series Creek Radnocentris Ornatus rads. <sighs> Talking of non-fish questions. From Bravehearts 1986. Bentley, just wondering your prediction on the Seattle Seahawks this season. Uh, I think it's going to be a miserable season. <laughs> I'm, I'm filming this before our first game. But just given um, we have two inconsistent quarterbacks um and one is kind of young we have uh we chose to keep our like ground and pound mentality coach which is very defense oriented very run centric and the best of our running backs chris carson retired due to neck injury uh that just it leads me to worry because yeah, Rashad Penny in the last, what, like six weeks of last season did really, really well. It was all against bottom 10 run defenses. So I think it's kind of, uh, statistically speaking, it's not a really good way to gauge his quality as a primary running back the entire time. Uh, we've also got folks like Travis Homer, who's, you know, he's okay. He's kind of fast, but he's not like a true marquee running back. Um, and I'm trying to remember who our other uh, Dallas, right? Dallas is the other main running back that we have, and he's a good, like, north to south straight line uh, kind of bulldozer style running back. But the problem is we've got some issues with a relatively new line who's probably not going to be as solid against some of your stronger run defenses. And if we don't have an air game whatsoever, a passing game, uh, it doesn't matter what your run game is. You're just going to get shut down. We don't have somebody like Dalvin Cook or Alvin Kamara or any of those like really top-notch running backs who can make magic happen. Uh, so I think we're going to be in trouble. Uh, I'm I'm not I, – well, let's put it this way. I don't have very high hopes. I really expect something more like a six-win season, not a lot. And that's okay. Like, I was a fan throughout the whole 90s and, and late 80s when the, the Seahawks just were terrible. You know, we were very fortunate that the Matt Hasselbeck through Russell Wilson years, we had phenomenal records in the grand scheme of things. We were, for the most part, very, very positive and got to be competitive for uh, really like 15 years out of about a 20-year span. That's that's amazing, right, in, in professional sports, especially the football league. Uh, and... You know, it was nice, but I'm upset that we chose our 70-year-old uh, coach over our Super Bowl winning multiple Pro Bowl quarterback. Getting a franchise quarterback is very hard. It's kind of like getting any phenomenally 
a spectacular player in any other sport like Mike Trout or Shohei Otani, <laughs> you know, these kind of guys uh, in baseball or Aaron Judge, if you're a Yankees fan. Um, it's so hard to get people that are just that good. Uh, so when you let them go and choose to, like, disintegrate what you had left, uh, it's, it's tough to be optimistic. But the hope is that within a reasonable number of years, they can put something interesting together and get some really good draft options. Uh, just, I'm kind of glad. I, I hope we don't pick up Jimmy Garoppolo. We'll put it that way. <laughs> I'll get off the sports. More fish stuff. More fish stuff. Less depressing, Bentley. <laughs> Bob Purcell, is it possible to community breed rainbow fish? Uh, so the short answer to this is kind of. Very specific rainbow fish. Uh, Praycox, the, so the dwarf neon rainbow, are one of the best examples here. Uh, and like Aves Creek and Upper Tor River are other great. So the Aves Creek, Bozmani, the Upper Tor, Chalatharina, uh, which uh, the Upper Tor you saw at Hoon Aquatics, right? Fantastic fish. They'll actually, if you saw his tank, right? He had tons of babies raising up with the parents. Uh, once you get to a certain kind of critical mass, the, the juveniles will start eating their younger <laughs> brothers and sisters. So there is some rate in which you can't just like continuously do that. But if you mean like community spawn in a mop and then move that mop, uh, quite a number of rainbow fish are pretty good about that and don't get too bad about eating their eggs. Uh, but it really yeah. is just dependent because sometimes a species that's known for being good will be an absolute nightmare for you. So it, it really depends on your tank, your feeding regimes, all those kind of things as to whether or not they're going to go completely crazy on you and, and try to eat all of their <laughs> all of their children before they're ever born. <laughs> um, but yeah, some of the best examples are the ones I gave you. So Praycox will. Uh, Master Breeder Dean actually used to colony spawn his in the sense of he would leave a mop in and let them just do their thing. And when he saw the first few fry, he'd just move the whole mop and he'd get hundreds of young baby fish to build up his next like batch that he was going to raise. Um and then, you know, we've seen uh, Hoon Aquatics in specific, if you watch him for a bit, he's done with both Aves Creek and with the Upper Tor, where parents and children have lived together. You can do this with Radnocentris pretty easily. Most of the rads are pretty chill, um, where you can keep them in the same tank as a colony and raise them up. You just have to have good hiding spaces and plants and give them a good amount of food, and you'll be okay. Pete Berlansky, the Aquarium Plant Man. What's up, Pete? Rotala or Ludwigia, if you could keep only one. Um, so here's my thing on this. I would pick Ludwigia, and let me explain why. In Rotala, there's lots of color variety and there's lots of options. But typically, the plant's actual like leaf shape and structure looks exactly the same. Where Ludwigia, you have a lot of different options. Like, we can look at Ludwigia pantanol looks way different than Ludwigia repens. Ludwigia... Um, <clears throat> Repens cross Arcuata looks different than both of those, right? There's a lot of differences that we can get in Ludwigia where we might see more of the same colors for the most part. There's some variation, of course, but we see a lot of leaf texture differences and in, in the way the actual plant's physical appearance changes. So in that regard, I would choose Ludwigia because I get a little bit more uh, texture options and not purely color options like a majority of Rotala. Yes, there are some differences. Some of them uh, have some, some differences in how they show up, but for the most part, they look very, very similar. And in that regard, I would much rather go for the uh, visual, physical differences over just the color differences. Uh, David Hahn, what to feed weak old rainbow fish fry? Great question. There's a couple of different options. So uh, at a week, I would not be doing baby brine shrimp. Just because they're still too small, there's a potential that some of them might get stuff caught in their throats. If you want to do a live food, uh, microworms are really good. But honestly, I think the easiest one here, because they will stay up in the upper water column, are vinegar eels. Vinegar eels are amazing for freshly hatched rainbow fish for their first couple weeks. Because, they'll, like I said, they stay up in the water column because they can stay alive for a bit in your fresh water as they're trying to get air. And they're they're trying to they're going to go toward the top water trying to get air, so they'll naturally be up where your baby bows are, and your baby bows can snipe them, and they're a perfect small food for babies. 
If you don't want to go the live food route, then I would look at a very fine powdered food like Serum Micron or Golden Pearls. You want it in the 5 to 50 micron range. Uh, potentially smaller is okay, but basically you want something that's very, very fine. It would be very hard for us aquarists without the right tools to do that out of any flake food or pellet food ourselves. Um, I've had the best luck personally with Serum Micron, but I know that um, some of the the better breeders out there, Gary Lang especially, they they basically live and swear by golden pearls, and they include it regularly in these teeny tiny vials when they send out vials of eggs at different uh, club auctions. So obviously the stuff works quite well. So that would be the options. The other thing that you can use um, is, is it chlorella powder? I have to look this up to make sure I'm not being wrong. Um, yeah, chlorella powder. Uh, you can find this at a, at a pretty small range in the grand scheme of things. So things like uh, in that similar micron range. But I would say if you want something that's kind of off the shelf that's more common, Ceramicron is probably your best bet. Uh, but if you really want to do the live food route and you want to go like optimal, perfect, either micro worms or vinegar eels is your best bet. Whichever is easier for you to maintain as a colony. Me personally, it's vinegar eels. And with that, folks, we've hit the end of the Ask Bentley segment. I want to thank everybody. We, do you want to come up for a second? Do you want to come up? Come here. No luck. He just wants to play. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's going to be the end. Oh, not the squeaker. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. My son, just take a minute. Uh, that'll be the end of our Ask Bentley segment. Thank you so much for those of you who've hung through this. I'll have to edit this some because uh, interruptions from Corgi Boy are a thing. And uh, we'll be back to our normal live streams next week. Thank you for, for hanging out and uh, enjoy this upcoming video this week. If you haven't seen the Hoon Aquatics interview, please, please, please check that out. Um, there's just a lot of cool stuff in there that I think answers a lot of things that some of us Aquarists deal with. And the fact that he is so good at prolifically breeding fish in basically like 12 tanks is really, really impressive. And I think there's a lot that can be learned from what he's learned in his time and some of the things that he does in his fish room. So with that being said, guys, thank you so much for watching and stay awesome.